Around the world, people drink over 2.25 billion cups of coffee every single day. That's a lot of coffee. But is coffee an addiction that's helping or harming our livers and bodies? Especially when scientists have found that just one cup has powerful effects. There are concerns, for example, that caffeine in coffee can overwork the liver, leading to damage or disease over time, and that coffee's acidity might irritate or harm the liver, similar to how it can affect the stomach's lining. So what does the research show? Well, a large review published in the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hepatology notes that drinking two or more cups of coffee a day improves liver function. It also protects against the progression of almost all forms of liver disease. And a more recent analysis of more than 500,000 participants in the UK Biobank with a follow-up period of almost 11 years reinforces these conclusions. Researchers observed a 21% lower risk of chronic liver disease and a 49% reduction in death from that condition condition when comparing regular coffee drinkers to non-drinkers. And the research has found, by the way, that this association with lower risk held even for those drinking decaffeinated coffee. But you'll often see claims that coffee causes cancer. So does it? Though there has been some controversy about this in the past, here is what we currently know. Researchers recently combined the results of 28 individual meta-analyses. In other words, they looked at mountains of data. Their conclusions? The highest quality evidence suggests that as coffee consumption increases, the risk of developing liver cancer goes down. Furthermore, they didn't find any solid evidence that coffee causes any types of cancer. Okay, but even if coffee appears to be good for our liver, the caffeine in coffee is a stimulant, so surely that can't be good for our heart and blood pressure. Well, surprisingly, a 2018 meta-analysis showed that people who consume coffee have a lower risk of high blood pressure. So here's what's likely going on. When we initially drink caffeinated coffee, yes, it does constrict our blood vessels, and this initially raises raises our blood pressure. However, coffee also has a diuretic effect. This causes our body to get rid of fluids, lowering our blood volume, which helps to lower blood pressure. But since caffeine is a stimulant, there are other concerns that coffee can result in our hearts going into dangerous rhythms. However, again, in a meta-analysis of seven observational studies involving over 100,000 individuals, caffeine exposure was not associated with the risk of atrial fibrillation, which is a dangerous kind of arrhythmia. A second meta-analysis and a large population-based cohort study confirmed this lack of association. Now, there are caveats to this. There are a couple of other arrhythmias that could happen. So while modest amounts of coffee appear safe, the guidelines err on the side of caution, and they suggest that patients susceptible to cardiac arrhythmias should avoid consuming large amounts of caffeine. Still, there are patients who are more sensitive to caffeine and see their palpitations connected to their caffeine intake. So if you're one of those people, talk to your doctor about whether you should avoid caffeine. So we've ticked off the liver, cancer, blood pressure, and heart arrhythmias. But the next concern is nuanced. What does coffee do to our cholesterol levels? And then we'll have a look at coffee's effects on dementia risks. We have research of over 132,000 adults showing no association between the intake of filtered coffee and total cholesterol. But filtered turns out to be the key qualifier here. With unfiltered coffee, we do see increases in cholesterol, including LDL cholesterol. So that's clearly not what we want. So the research supports avoiding unfiltered coffee. That means steering clear, for instance, of a French press. It's also worth considering to use filter paper if you're using an espresso machine. But when we have a look at overall cardiovascular health, there is great news. A massive long-term study from the UK associated regular coffee consumption of up to five cups a day with significant reductions in the risks of heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular diseases. So let's take a look at one last area that's impacted by regular coffee consumption, and that is dementia. An important study on the link between coffee consumption and dementia was published in 2021. It looked at information from the UK Biobank that involved over 365,000 participants over an average follow-up of 11.4 years. They found that compared to people who don't drink tea or coffee, drinking two or three cups of tea or coffee a day was associated with a whopping 28% lower risk of dementia. But what the authors found is a U-shaped association. So I do want to exercise caution here. A lot of the time when we look at these observational studies, we can find U-shaped association curves. So while observational research can show us exciting possibilities, we need controlled studies to make sure that we understand what's causing the effect we see. 
Now, I want to address a claim that's widely circulated online. Is it really true that we shouldn't drink coffee first thing in the morning? You'll find plenty of health influencers giving this advice. So what's the logic behind it? Well, there are two main reasons given. The first is that people claim that it causes an unwanted rise in cortisol levels. Cortisol plays many important roles in the body and one of them is helping us to feel awake and alert. Cortisol levels, they naturally rise rapidly when we first wake up, peaking after about 30 minutes. But neither do we want too much cortisol because over the long term it's associated with negative effects like weight gain, raised blood pressure, muscle weakness and osteoporosis. And yes, coffee can make cortisol levels go up and that's why some people think it's better not to drink coffee when you first wake up because your cortisol is already at its highest level. But the logic doesn't hold up and here's why. Coffee loses much of its power to elevate cortisol levels once our bodies get used to it. After just five days of regular coffee intake, people have stopped having a cortisol response to their initial cup of coffee. So the first reason given to avoid an early morning coffee is flawed. It doesn't appear to be a problem for our cortisol levels. The second reason that's often given relates to our adenosine levels. Adenosine helps to trigger sleepiness and it naturally builds up in the body during the day. Caffeine blocks adenosine, which is why it helps us keep awake. The theory here is that when we wake up, our adenosine levels are at their lowest, so caffeine won't have much, if any, benefit because there's hardly any adenosine to block. But there are two problems here. The first is that blocking adenosine isn't the only impact of coffee, so even if it isn't as effective for this purpose first thing in the morning, it could still make sense to drink it right away. The second is that caffeine it stays in our system for a really long time, so its effects of blocking adenosine continues long after you drink it. That means that delaying our first cup of coffee by a little bit isn't going to make that much difference. In fact, this gives us a reason not to delay drinking coffee. The average half-life of caffeine in the human body is about 5 hours, so that means that after 5 hours you'll still have about 50% of the caffeine in your system. After 10 hours it would be 25%, and after 15 hours it would be 12.5%. And since caffeine is a stimulant, it affects our sleep, so some people will say that caffeine doesn't affect their sleep and that they can still get to sleep easily even if they have a coffee late at night. But even if you can get to sleep, caffeine affects the quality of our sleep, so you likely won't be as rested as what you could be in the morning. So it makes sense to have our coffee early in the day and avoid degrading our sleep quality. So I tell my patients to aim to have their last cup of coffee within four hours of waking up. So if you want to delay your first cup of coffee by a couple of hours because of what you've heard an influencer say, that's entirely your call. But I wouldn't have any more caffeine after four hours of waking up. But leaving timing aside, how can even a single cup of coffee affect us? Well, there are a surprising number of benefits, and there's a sweet spot where we can get just the right amount of caffeine to maximize the benefits and avoid any problems. So let's start with exercise performance, and the key ingredient is caffeine. Multiple studies show that it improves exercise capacity during prolonged exercise, so greater than 90 minutes, as well as high intensity training between 20 and 60 minutes. It even helps with short duration, high intensity exercise exercise from about 1 to 5 minutes. It seems to improve the speed of our movements both in the upper and lower body, and that's according to a meta-analysis that combined 12 separate randomized clinical trials together. There's also great research showing that caffeine helps us react faster, delays fatigue, and improves performance in tennis. So from what we know today, it appears that the optimum amount of caffeine for these performance boosting effects is about 200 milligrams. That's what you'd get in about 1 to 2 cups of coffee. And that same cup of coffee can give us impressive cognitive benefits. But intriguingly, the impact of our brain's performance doesn't seem to come from only caffeine. Researchers recently found that coffee, but interestingly not caffeine alone, stimulated regions of the brain responsible for visual processing, memory and goal setting. Our brain's functions are complex, so while coffee has measurable effects, we need a lot of other nutrients to be at our peak performance, and that's why I take microvitamin, which includes a number of ingredients associated with brain health. But just because I take a supplement does in no way mean that you should as well. A single cup of coffee can also boost our mood. One study found that people's ratings of their overall mood were significantly increased after a cup of coffee. Interestingly, decaf coffee also had measurable impacts. But while coffee is associated with plenty of potential benefits to our liver, heart, brain and muscle performance, what's the perfect amount? Well, the US FDA set a level of up to 400 milligrams a day for healthy adults. 
If we have more than this, then we can run into problems like sleep disruption. So what does that translate to in terms of cups of coffee? Well, the amount of caffeine in coffee, it ranges widely, depending on the type and how it's brewed, as well as other factors. A finer grind, for instance, releases more caffeine when brewed. A cup of coffee may have as little as 80 milligrams, but it can go all the way up to 400. Most sources, though, will say that a typical cup of coffee brewed at home will contain about 100 milligrams of caffeine. So looking at all of these studies that we've gone through, it appears that the sweet spot is around two to three cups of coffee a day. At that level, we can lock in the benefits, but we can minimize the side effects specifically to our sleep. Again, caffeine lasts in our body a really long time, so we don't want to overdo it. I tell my patients that regular coffee consumption is fine for most people and can be part of a healthy lifestyle. And as we've seen, there are some surprising health benefits. But one thing that I also tell them is not to add cream or sugar. Consum Consuming sweets and saturated fats is associated with a whole host of negative health outcomes. The health benefits we've seen when it comes to drinking coffee might sound like a lot of those often claimed for certain supplements, but there's an important difference. Most supplements have nowhere near the amount and quality of data that we have for coffee. A lot of supplements are just a waste of money based on hype. But not all. There are some supplements that actually work, so make sure to check out this next video here where I go through all of the research.